Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We welcome everyone here to the North Cape Lounge, where we have a once again profile TV interview with our star on board, the SS Norway. And it's certainly a privilege to have the gentleman back on board again this week, my buddy, my friend, and a very excellent, fantastic talent, Mr. Roger Williams. <laughs> Now, Raja, I said again, now we got to tell everybody, how many times have you been on board the SS Norway performing? Been on, <laughs> I've been on at least a dozen times. A dozen times. And I'll tell you more. one thing, you're going to keep coming back until you get it right. You're I'll right. tell you. Okay. <laughs> First of all, let's establish uh, where hometown is for you, for some of these people that might not know. Where's your home? I was born in Omaha, but actually I was brought up in Des Moines, Iowa. I'm a Midwest guy. Anybody care about that? Huh? No Midwesterners in here? Okay, that's good. Okay, we want to know what we have to look forward to tonight, Roger. I know what we look forward to, but tell these lovely people. The best concert of my career. <laughs> All right. <laughs> no, really, uh, people ask me what my best concert is. I always say the one ahead because I'm always trying to top myself. And you know, Don, a lot of people on this cruise have saved up for many, many months, some of them for years, They've been planning this a long time. I want to give them a show they're not going to forget tonight. I'm going to give it my best shot. I can promise you that. Well, I can tell you. <laughs> Even if it's not your best shot, it's a great show. Well, I'll thank you. I've seen, I've seen you perform too many times, and it's absolutely fantastic. So you folks have something to look forward to. And what we want to know now is um, you're a talented gentleman, and uh, here you are, one of the world's greatest piano players. How did you end up... A piano player. You didn't wake up one morning and says, Roger Williams is going to be a piano player when he grows up. How did this all come about? How did you end up with the piano? I think the toughest thing in life is to figure out what you do best. And many times the thing you do best is so easy for you, you don't even realize that you're good at it. Um, by the time I was 12, I played 13 different instruments. And I could play anything that I picked up. But it was so simple that I just never wanted to practice. I never wanted to work. I uh, boxed for a few years, believe it or not. I have, a, yeah. I have a bachelor's degree in engineering. And it wasn't until I got out of school that I finally decided that maybe I could really play the piano. And then I started to work 8, 10 hours a day. And that did it. But I really believe that every one of us has a, a talent that nobody in the world has. And sometimes it's so easy for us, and it's so obvious that we just pass over it. I did. I thought uh, I should be doing something that was hard. And piano playing or any music to me was very simple. So I didn't think it was really worth very much or very important. I think the uh, thing that changed my mind a great deal was that uh, I finally got with a teacher that practiced uh, ESP. Eat, sleep, and practice. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> well, how, uh, in your estimation, what is the best way uh, to get a child to practice? I know sometimes it's not easy. They want to go out and play baseball or be out with the boys on the street or something like that. How do you? How would you do it if you were a teacher? How would you get the child to practice? Well, f I don't know. For years, I've always heard young people come up to me, and some of the people my age come up and say, well, I had to practice when I was a kid, and my teacher had a ruler, and boy, when I missed a note, the ruler came down on my wrist, and mom made me practice, and dad made me practice, and I have sort of a quarrel with parents about that, because I can't get over these dads. They'll take their sons to every baseball game in the country, and the son comes home and he wants to play baseball. That's cool. That's what I did. But I remember the first concert I heard. In fact, it was a farewell tour of the great pianist Paderewski. And my folks took me to see him. And at the end of the concert, Don, why, everybody in the place stood up. And boy, they started applauding like crazy and yelling. And all of a sudden I said, gee, you know, maybe that could happen to me someday. Maybe I could be up there. Maybe they could be applauding for me. And that's what happens when you take your kids to the baseball game. And there's nothing wrong with that. But all I say is if you want your kids to really practice, they got to do it themselves. They got to want to do it in here. 
I know that for years why my mother used to put a big plate of cookies on the piano and a pitcher of milk. And I'd practice till the cookies ran out, and then I'd run out. <laughs> because I wasn't really, you know, I wasn't that interested in practicing. But once I saw some of the great musicians and some of the great pianists, then all of a sudden I said, hey, maybe that could be me. And I think that's the best advice I could give any of you people with your children. Take them to see the great musicians. And if it takes, great. If it doesn't, they still have a good uh, musical appreciation, just like I have an appreciation for baseball. <laughs> well, Roger, uh, let me ask you this now. You, uh, I consider you one of the greatest piano players I've ever heard. Uh, along the way, a lot of people say all of a sudden they'll hear the Roger Williams album and he becomes famous and you've done television and you got albums all over the world. And they say, oh, a star overnight. Now, this doesn't really happen. Uh, why don't you tell the people some of the little bounces along the way that you had and actually how it first started when you got your first break. I like that story. Well, now that's uh, an hour interview in itself. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> no, but I think that uh, the big thing I finally wanted to do was work. Discipline and drive. Those are the two things that I really uh, go by. If I can maintain discipline, and that meant lots of times when I was uh, in college, the latter part of it, when I finally decided to be a musician and went for my master's and my doctorate, that meant uh, turning down some dates with some pretty good-looking girls. That meant going to, uh, not going to a lot of parties. That meant working on weekends, practicing hard. And I finally d developed the drive, and then I got the discipline. The discipline to sit at this damn piano for eight, ten hours a day and practice and work. And I got into the jazz field in the beginning when I was at Juilliard. And when I... Uh, played on the Arthur Godfrey show and won, and won on Chance of a Lifetime, I was signed by a man by the name of David Capp, who had discovered Eddie Duchin, who had discovered Carmen Cavallaro, who had discovered Frankie Carl. Any of you guys remember them? Uh, those are big yeah. names. Yeah. Well, anyway, he heard me play jazz, and he said, hey, you play good jazz, but he said, I've never heard anybody play the melody like you do. And I said, well, that's easy. I, anybody can know. He said, nobody can do that. He said, you play the melody better than anybody I ever saw because you play the words. He said, when it says, I love you, you play that way. When it says, I hate you, your tone gets very cold and hard. He said, I think we can sell that. So he took me into the recording studio. And I started to improvise and play. He said, play the melody. And the next thing I knew, he wheeled out a big cigar store Indian about this high. And the cigar store Indian had his hand up to his head like this, like he was saluting somebody. And there was a big sign above the Indian's head. And it said, where is the melody? Now here I was in the studio practicing. And every time I'd get off the melody, he'd point to the Indian. <laughs> where is the melody? <laughs> and uh, my first single record was Autumn Leaves. And uh, he was right. He knew what I did best. And from then on, I've been, I love jazz. I love all kinds of music. But I play the melody, and I think that's what I do best. Could you, uh, I mean, you're sitting right by your instrument here. Could you give us a little sample of, of this, how someone else would play a tune that then Roger Williams would take it and do it the Roger Williams way? Oh, there's a million ways to play tunes. That's another thing I did. I learned everybody else's style. I stole from everybody I could find. And the kids come to me today and say, how do I develop my own style? Well, how does a doctor develop his style? How does a scientist develop his style? He learns everything that went before. He learns all the discoveries that came before him, and then he goes one step further. And that's what I've tried to do in my music. I can play in just about any style you Probably this is the style that you know best for me. Now, uh, you know, somebody said uh, something about Floyd Kramer a while ago. <laughs> <laughs>
I don't play his style, but... So on, right. you got to learn all these styles. You know, I, I, I've never heard anybody get hit as many notes as you do in my life. When I heard your recording of Autumn Leaves, I thought you were the only 15-fingered piano player I've ever heard. But you really get those notes in there. That's Thank fantastic. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think at this point it will be a good time to open up any question and answer session for uh, Roger. We're ready for any questions that you got. Uh, any general, objective, or even personal questions. Roger can handle anything. Mr. Williams, I think I will voice for everyone how much we have enjoyed your music over the years. And one of the places where I have heard you and really enjoyed you is on the Hour of Power with Reverend Schuler. And my question is this, do you appear on the Hour of Power because you are a deeply religious man or do you find playing the piano a way in which you can express your worship to God or is it because you're just a very good friend of Reverend Schuler's? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> to all of those. <laughs> all of those things. He's a great guy. He really is. He's one of the most dynamic uh, fellows I've ever met in my life. I went out there and played a concert at his church about 10 years ago. And I kind of got hooked on his philosophy. Because I got to tell you, there's one place where I differ with him a little bit. And that's fine. Everybody has their own opinion. I think life can be pretty grim if we look at it realistically. I think that if many of us saw what was ahead for us in life, we'd be pretty sad about things. And if we look for the negatives in life, by golly, they're there. You can get so upset about so many things in life. But one thing Schuler says, he said, you've got to look to the positives. And I look to the positives not so much even for my religious beliefs, but I know it's the only really way to get through this life. I really believe that. The only way to get through this life, because the minute you start with the negatives, you're going downhill. You're inviting heart attacks. You're inviting ulcers. You're inviting cancer. All the horrible things that we read about and all of us hope we don't get. So I, I practice positive thinking just out of necessity. I've got to put on those rose colored glasses once in a while when things look very gray. And I've got to say, hey, I don't like that guy too well, but by golly, there must be something about him I like. There must be something to like in him. Because heaven knows if I look, I can find plenty of things wrong with a lot of people in this world. But if you look for the best, I think you got a pretty good shot of getting through this life. Now, is that too practical? But that's the way I feel. I like it. <laughs> okay, right down front, Roger. I was just wondering if he has any uh, concerts scheduled in Texas in the near future, especially Beaumont or Port Arthur or Houston. <laughs> I got to Ask him what he tell us about the little story uh, that happened in Port Arthur, Texas. Well, since you're from Port Arthur, I'll tell you about it. Um, in answer to your question, I've got my career to the point now where somebody leads me up to the piano and somebody leads me away. And I really don't know where I, I think next week, where are we next week? I don't even know. Uh, we go so many places. I've done seven albums this year. I have to record next week. That's right. Then we go back on the road again. Last week I was three days with the St. Louis Symphony and just came home in time to do this. Um, in, in answer to your question in Port Arthur, you know, Port Arthur is a very humid place. I don't know if you people have been there, but Texas, the southern part of Texas, boy, you can sweat just picking up your hand. And uh, we got down there for their first concert of the season, Don, and it was in September. And they'd had their piano down in the basement all year, storing it, 
for the summer. So they brought the piano up, opened the piano up, I sat down, I pressed the first key, it went down and stayed down. <laughs> I pressed the second key, it went down, and right up the piano. Every one of them were sticking because the felts in the piano had swelled up. So here we had a concert that night. It was the only piano in town that was a concert grand, and we didn't know what to do. And I played, uh, I think I played that for the Kiwanis Club. So the guys got a brilliant idea. They said, hey, let's call up our wives and have them bring down their hairdresser, uh, hair, hair blowers, you know, hair dryers, right, right. electric ones. And they attached them up all the way around the piano. They took the lid off the piano. The gals stood there with their hair dryers on all the felts. And by the time we got to the concert, everything was well. The felts were working, the piano was working, we had a great night. That's one place you'll never forget. Right? Never forget. <laughs> Cute gals, too, around the piano. <laughs> All right, down to the right here, Roger. Roger, how about Southern California when you're coming to Los Angeles? And also, we'd like to know, are you a married man, and how many children do you have? Okay, I have three children. And all, uh, two of them are musicians, and they're wonderful. One of them, uh, you're just asking me about my son. He's out with Al Jarreau right now on a concert tour. My kids love music, but it's kind of tough for kids. Uh, one of them sings, and the other plays guitar, and I'm kind of glad about that because it's kind of hard to step into your old man's uh, shoes and continue from there. Well, that's where the money is today, guitars and singing. You're right, you're right. <laughs> And so I think she asked about her hometown there. What was that question? Oh, Southern California. California. Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't know, Carl. Will we we be playing there? Carl, any anytime soon in Southern California? Do we have anything at Los Angeles? We are in Dallas in January of 86. We're in Dallas. 86, uh-huh. Right. Okay. Nothing right now. Roger, how many albums have you recorded? Over 100. How many years? I started in 55. I remember they had to change my diaper three times on that first session. I, <laughs> 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 uh, I, like that. I have to remember that one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> As, uh, speaking of the albums, while we uh, got that question going, unless we have a, a quick question here. Yeah. Okay, Roger, uh, you say you're from Omaha. Yeah. And you're raised in Des Moines. That's right. Are you a corn husker or are you a Hawkeye? <laughs> <laughs> Both. Good. I'm a corny Hawkeye. <laughs> <laughs> okay, in the, in the albums, uh, go ahead and find someone else there, uh, Howard. But on the albums, uh, uh, you've just finished one that, uh, called Amadeus. Mm -hmm. And that is out now, right? Yes, it just and came out on the MCA label. Well, now, when you were here before, I want to let the folks know what we're talking about albums here. I have right here, Roger Williams' Ivory Impact. As a little story goes behind this as well. This is an excellent, excellent, can you get that without a shine on it? This is fantastic. Now, what's the outstanding story about this particular one? Well, the only thing about this is, again in life, you never know where the breaks are coming from or what's going to happen tomorrow. I got a call from Paul McCartney asking me to make this album. It's a double pocket album and it's with the London Symphony. And I had no idea that Paul was even a fan or knew who I was, but I certainly knew who the Beatles were. But uh, I kept hearing disc jockeys tell me that he really liked my playing. So he wanted me to come over to London and do this album, but I was on tour and I was booked for the next six months and I said, I just can't make it. So I sent the arrangements over to London. The London Philharmonic recorded it. They sent it back to me, and I recorded on top of that. And I had never done that in my life. And it scared me like I can't tell you, because I, I always like to record with my orchestra around me. You get a warm feeling. But believe it or not, We've gotten better critical review on this album than any album I ever put out, and Columbia and RCA Victor both chose it as their pick of the month. Wow. So um, you never know. You've got to try new things. Every you know? time. 
And of course, while we're on the album, you can't, we can't let this moment go without letting them know that your latest album is to Armadeus with Love. Now, yeah, that was a great movie. Yeah. And uh, this is a beautiful album, too. So this is a tribute to uh, Mozart, right? Somebody asked me a while ago if I was going to do an album of Prince's music. And I said, yeah, maybe we could call it uh, Finger Prince. <laughs> Meanwhile, <laughs> <laughs> I got a couple of booze on that one. <laughs> okay, over here, the question there. Uh, I was just going to ask you about your private life, like traveling so much, and do you have much home life, or how do you handle that sort of thing? It ain't, it ain't easy. Much? It isn't easy, believe me. Yeah. I was married for 26 years, and I think my wife probably got a little tired of me being on the road because she was not a show business person or could quite understand what I was doing. I'm going to be married for the second time uh, December 1st by Dr. Schuler in the Crystal Cathedral. And I've married a girl that I've gone with for 11 years now. And we think this one's really going to stick. We've sure had a chance to get acquainted in that time, believe me. She's a doll. In fact, she was supposed to be here with me this week, but she's working on Dynasty all week, so uh, she couldn't get away. She was on with Roger last time, and I'll tell you, Roger not only plays a great piano, but he can pick out some great women, I'll tell you that. <laughs> she's gorgeous. Well, she's my age, a few years younger, and uh, we're very happy. Uh, she's a beauty. Roger, have you ever written your own music? Yes, I've written a lot of my music, but I'm a lousy salesman. I play great piano. You know, that's an amazing thing to me. Uh, people are always coming up to me and asking me questions about everything in life, from the nuclear age to uh, mathematics and everything else. I play great piano. I'm a lousy golfer. There's so many things I don't do. I think that this is kind of an age of specialization. And if you're going to do something, I think you have to pretty much concentrate on that. So I can answer good questions questions about the piano, but I certainly am not an expert on politics, although I've played for every president now since President Truman, with the exception of uh, Jimmy Carter. And we were supposed to play for him, but we had another symphonic date that night, and he never called me back again. So. <laughs> well, they do things slow in Georgia. It took him a while to get around to it. <laughs> okay. Has your prospective wife got a name? Yes, Louise DiCarlo. Louise DiCarlo. Wonderful girl. I wanted to ask him if he had composed any more music uh, while out on the fishing pier. As I recall, one time I heard him, he said he was on the fishing pier and he took this stick. And what was the name of that tune? Do you, Boy, you have a memory. I sure do. <laughs> yeah, that was a song I wrote called uh, Whirl Away which went very fast, a uh, very technical thing. And uh, I, I, I guess I put that on an album, but I'm always reluctant to put my things on albums. I don't know why, and I've written a lot of stuff. <laughs> okay, over here to the right, Roger. Of the songs that you've written, which was the most popular for you? Okay, I had a hit with Autumn Leaves. I had a hit with Till. I had a hit with Two Different Worlds. I had a hit with Near You. I had a hit with Born Free, and I had a hit with The Impossible Dream. And I have 18 gold records up on the wall. <laughs> How about that? Yeah. Thank you. That's uh, some sort of a record itself, 18 gold records. Roger, before we close out here, I'm, uh, I wish we could keep this thing going a little while longer. Hey, I like these, this yeah. gang, Don. I time, wish uh, time does not permit, uh, unfortunately. What is your ambition? Uh, that's a funny, a funny question to ask a guy who's a star. But uh, let, let's see what kind of answer I get here. What is your ambition? I just want to be more and more me. The guy that said, know thyself, which was Socrates, I said, I think said one of the most profound things that has ever been said in this world. I think all of us spend our time trying to figure out, who am I? What do I like? How can I function to my greatest degree? How can I get whatever is in me out? Whatever talent that is. 
And that's all I want to do. I don't want to play Hamlet, as they said. I don't want to be a movie star. I just want to play better and better every day. And I want to get more and more of me into this thing. Well, that's a great ambition. But then let me ask you one more question before we close out. Sure. Do you ever plan to retire? Well, you know, people are always saying, I want to retire and do what I want to do. So I, I think I am going to retire. I'm going to retire and play the piano. <laughs> well, I'll tell you one thing, Roger, and to everyone sometime soon, because once you do, and once we don't hear the Roger Williams sound, we're going to be missing something in the music world. For those of you who have not seen uh, Roger perform, or for those of you who are sitting out there thinking, well, how can a piano player just do a show? How can I sit through an hour of piano music? Well, let me tell you right now, you come see Roger Williams perform, and you'll be seeing one of the greatest shows you've seen and one of the greatest performers you've seen, not just a great piano player. And it's been my pleasure to have Roger Williams on my show. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Hey, you're special. <laughs>